This is the Brindlewood Bay Mystery Writing Contest Workshop. I want to have us, um, well, I think what I want to do is let's just talk about some basics here, what we're going to do, and then I'll introduce myself and stuff. But basically, we are going to have three hours. Um, the first hour is going to be dedicated to the beginning part of the mystery structure, uh, the pre presenting the mystery and the suspects principally. The second hour is going to be devoted to locations and clues. And then the final hour will be distinctions for sweep sweep mysteries plus just general questions. My name is Jason Cordova. I am the founder of the Gauntlet Gaming Community and the co-owner of Gauntlet Publishing. I am also the creator of Brindlewood Bay. And with all of that said, um, I'm going to just dive right into it. The first hour is going to be presenting the mystery and suspects slash side characters because they're called side characters and sweep sweep mysteries, right? Um, the first 20 minutes or so, it's going to be me just going over some things and then we'll open it up for discussion after that. So the thing is, big picture wise, it's really important for your mystery to have a, a big idea or a theme, okay? This is really important. So that big idea for a murder mystery, especially, it's very helpful if it's focused on a location or a distinct group of people who are together for a reason, right? Um, I'll rattle off some examples. A Mexican restaurant, a IT professional convention, um, a, uh, a game convention where everyone's playing sorcery, the convalescence, right? Like something like that, right? Those are your, just a, a big idea, a reason for a bunch of like-minded people or roughly like-minded people to be together in a place, right? Um, or a theme. Themes are another great way of sort of organizing your mystery and sort of having a, a touchstone for your mystery as you're writing it, right? So in the mystery Jingle Bell Shock, it motifs and big idea wise, it's, it's a Christmas mystery, right? But the theme of that mystery really truly is like uh, family trauma and family history, right? Like that's kind of the big theme. So at the outset, when you're writing your mystery, have that big idea or that theme, or even just something simple like a visual motif that you can return to when you're needing ideas, right? Because sometimes you'll just need something to return to periodically. So at the outset, that's really important. Um, complexity is either six, seven, or eight. <laughs> Those, that is the rule. Uh, to break it down a little bit more specifically, if your mystery is local to the town of Brindlewood Bay and is a, what we're gonna call a simpler mystery, although it doesn't really have that much meaning, um, it is a complexity six. If it is a more complex mystery for however you define more complex, uh, but it's set in Brindlewood Bay, then that's a complexity seven. Or if it's a less complex mystery outside of Brindlewood Bay, that's a complexity seven. And then a more complex mystery outside of Brindlewood Bay is an eight. These, this is very, very loose guidelines. Um, and it's really just your judgment of how you want to, how you want to gauge it. Um, I consider simpler mysteries to be mysteries that take place primarily in one location and more complex mysteries to be mysteries that can go into other parts of, of the setting, whether that be the town of Brindlewood Bay or wherever your mystery is set. Um, obviously for sweep sweep mysteries, the, by definition, the mysteries take place outside of Brindlewood Bay. And so you can kind of um, make your own judgment as far as like what you want the complexity to be, but seven or eight is probably appropriate. Okay, presenting the mystery. This is kind of getting into the real substance here. A few goals, like what is the purpose of this part of the mystery? Well, you wanna present some key details. For the murder mystery, you obviously want to, uh, at some point, define how the victim is killed or like how they were found or whatever, right? Who the victim was. For a sweep sweep mystery, it could be just setting up basic details about the the setting, uh, the problem that the, that the people are having that are the side characters, like what is the thing that is sort of the problem, just the key kind of like details. You want to give the keeper some guidance on how to run the introduction of the mystery, because frequently this is like a scene or a sequence of scenes where like characters are being introduced or in the case of a sweep sweep mystery, the setting is being introduced, right? So give some advice to the keeper about how to run that scene, kind of how to manage it, Give the mavens some leads to follow, places and characters. If it is a bottle mystery or a closed room mystery, I think it's wise to introduce all of the suspects. Um, like just have that 
introductory be how do we meet all the suspects? If it is a more of a roaming mystery, uh, definitely mention some key characters that goes back to like giving them leads, um, even if the mavens don't meet them right in the beginning. And then you wanna have an establishing question, which we'll talk about in a bit. The really important thing though for presenting the mystery is this is your opportunity, particularly as it relates to this contest as well. This is your opportunity to make your mystery stand out because the presentation of the mystery is the only part of the mystery that is not structured in a certain way, right? You can, you can kind of write it however you wanna write it and you can introduce elements that you wanna introduce. Um, if you look at some of the mysteries that are out there in the world, uh, I love to, okay, so I'll hollow scream, which is the Halloween one, right? That one has a fun little mini procedure inside the presentation where you, where the mavens have to describe their Halloween costume, right? It's a small thing, but it makes that moment a little more special and it makes that mystery stand out. It's a little more special. Jingle Bell Shock, they have to talk about their ugly Christmas sweater, right? In the Great Brindlewood Bay Bake Off, that one has a whole sequence of things you do where, where there's like a contest for the baking goods, right? Uh, if you all have access to Exit Stage Death, and I'll share a folder later that does if you need it, um, Exit Stage Death has a really kind of complex presentation, but it's cool, right? Because it's like they're going to watch this strange play and all these bizarre things that are happening and the players have to describe it. There's even a custom move in there. If you're very bold, you can write a custom move, right? Um, I guess what I mean to say is the presentation is really your chance to put your mark on things and to make your mystery stand out from the pack, right? So I, I recommend really putting a lot of thought into that part of it. So yeah, okay. Establishing question. This is kind of the final part of presenting the mystery. The goal of the establishing question is to get at least one maven a little more invested in the mystery or to get the players more invested in the mystery or both. An establishing question can create a historical connection between the maven and the mystery. So in Dad Overboard, one of the mavens has to say how they know one of the Krauss children, right? It can create an emotional connection between the maven and the mystery. So in Jingle Bell Shock, a maven has to explain how the sort of pariah victim is was a nicer person than people generally thought. Or in, um, what's the other one? Oh, in All Hallows Scream, one of the mavens actually has like a sort of romantic connection with one of the characters, right? Like, like that's the sort of way you can kind of pull the mavens in. You can increase the stakes. So in Exit Stage Death, the establishing question basically raises the stakes on like what, you know, because if I recall correctly, one of the nephews is involved in the production, right? And so like automatically, like the, the characters are more involved because of that detail, right? Because the nephew could be implicated. Um, another thing you can do with the establishing question, and this is a more subtle thing, but in a lot of ways, a more interesting thing. You can let the players start shaping the lore of the setting or the location. This is really helpful for sweep sweep mysteries, right? Because it takes the characters out of Brindlewood Bay, right? So if you look at um, the hex files, uh, which is one of the sweep sweep mysteries, the establishing question says, what dark legend surrounds the town of Devilwood? That's a great question because essentially you're inviting the players to kind of put their thumb on things to like, def to they're already kind of solving the mystery, right? Even before any dice have hit the table, right? This is something we do in my other game, The Between. In The Between, the establishing questions are very much about getting the characters already on the mystery. Like by the time we join the characters, they've already started investigating, right? So this is kind of what's, what's happening there. You're kind of letting the players kind of like dictate some of the mystery already straight away. And that gets them invested, right? Gives them, gives them to buy in. There's another mystery called A Murder Most Mucky. It's not a sweepstick mystery. It's one of the core mysteries, but that one takes place in another town. And it's a town that is a kind of an Innsmouth type town where like, um, it's suggested that people have been breeding with fish people, right? <laughs> um, but in any case, the question is, what is the, what's the rumor that people say about mucky pointers? Like what is their, their physical characteristic that they're all supposed to have, right? So it just gives you a chance to kind of build the lore. And in these like creepier mysteries, it gives you, it gives the players a chance to kind of get involved in that creepier, more supernatural stuff. So I think it's a lot of fun. All right. 
I'm going to turn it over to questions in a moment. I want to run through suspects and suspects and side characters first, and then we'll get to the, the Q&A. OK, suspects and side characters. How many should you have? Uh, between seven and 10, depending on the complexity. You can have more. It's fine. Uh, you can have less, but if it makes sense for your mystery. But seven, between seven and 10 is the, the, the typical amount. The goal of your suspects when you're writing them or your side characters. In a murder mystery, you want to create a varied cast of characters, any one of whom might have done it, right? So um, even if even if it seems unusual that a character might have done it, uh, don't you should still include them, right? Like, like I think one of the mysteries has like a dog. <laughs> it's like potentially the suspect, right? Like, you know, the fun of figuring out how the dog might have done it is the fun of the game, right? So um so, so but, but, but the goal though is just to have a varied cast of characters uh, of people who might have done it. In a sweep sweep mystery for the side characters, it's kind of a slightly different goal. In this case, you want to give the keeper a variety of characters they can use in a variety of scenes or situations, okay? So just characters that might show up for some reason. That's, um, that's, that's kind of the goal there. In terms of writing the characters, the structure is name and role, three descriptive details, a short description of how they function in the story, and then a quote. So for their name and role, uh, first and last name is helpful if they're a character that has a first and last name. Their role is usually in relation to the victim in a murder mystery. Uh, so if it's, you know, the victim's uh, wife, you would say name of character, uh, a wife or his wife, right? Um, and so forth, or their kid or whatever. It doesn't have to be though. Uh, the role ultimately is just sort of how we understand at a high level like who this character is sometimes it's their job um in a sweep sweep mystery having their role be like their job or their role in the community is is usually a good approach three descriptive details their appearance uh maybe if how they smell is important um if they have a distinct manner of speech what you're doing when you give these three descriptive details is you are assisting the keeper in how to role play the character, right? So to describe the character, and if they have a particular manner of speech, you put that in there so that the keeper knows. Um, I like this, this technique comes from uh, creative writing advice. Uh, a lot of creative writing advice will tell you use three details when you're describing places and people, right? And so um, I think that's a good approach. Sensory details are important. Um, and so, yeah, if you, three usually covers it and then after that, the players can kind of fill in the rest in their heads. You have a short description of how they function in the story. In a murder mystery, this usually hints at a motive that they might have. It doesn't have to, but it usually does. It otherwise just kind of says their basic outlook on things. In a sweep sweep mystery, it's the same thing, except something you can do in a sweep sweep mystery that is kind of fun is if you also say, if that character has a theory about what's going on, right? <laughs> uh, that's a great place to put it in there, right? So uh, just to kind of add that texture to it. And then your quote. A quote is one of those other like big highlight ways you can make your mystery stand out um, in the contest, especially. This is something that a character might actually say to a maven. And when I run the game, I like always work the quote in. <laughs> like I find a way to put the, I like literally read the quote out loud, right? Um, but also it tells the keeper something about that character's personality. So a well-written quote will tell you a lot about like how to role play that character, how that character's outlook is. Um, it's really nice if there's like some humor or if there's some weirdness. So the David Krause quote in David Dad Overboard is kind of like a good example, of like a funny one. Um, in Exit Stage Death, the Gregor Thune quote is a good example of an extremely weird one, but I promise you whenever the Keeper says that quote in play, it's a big moment at the table, like everybody goes crazy and loses their mind, right? So, um, or like in my other game, The Between, uh, there are certain characters where they live and die by their quotes, right? Like, the, like their quote is the thing that people remember about them, right? So it's your chance to really make the character stand out and to make your mystery stand out. So, so don't like, don't rush through that part like really think about that part. Um, it's where you get to be most like a writer, right? Like a creative writer. Okay, so that's pretty good, 15 minutes. Um, I am now going to open it up for questions. The way this is gonna work is if you have a question, you can just raise your hand and uh, I'll call on you or you can stay in the chat and I'll call on you. Um, if you have a question or a comment, um, 
uh, well, basically say your question and then everybody else can just chime in. It's not necessarily a question just for me. Anybody who wants to speak can speak, but just do your best to let me know in the chat if you want to speak or to raise your hand, or if I'm not seeing you raise your hand, put it in the chat. <laughs> so, um, so with all that said, does anybody have anything they want to talk about? I'm looking for hands. All right, chaotic, go for it. Uh, hi, I'm chaotic. Uh, my pronouns are he, they. Um, I think like it's less about what you directly said, but something I thought about uh, just the other day about like how uh, Brindlewood Bay mysteries are just written, at least from what I've seen of, uh, of yours, uh, Jason. They all sorts of like have like sort of snappy sorts of humor. Like there is a certain joy within like it's like uh, like I think one of the side characters uh, like you wrote them like does like finger guns constantly and that sort of thing and I think that's very unique to Brindlewood Bay mysteries in particular that it has a certain level of like humor and I'm really not sure like how to capture that in terms of like setting up the mystery and what have you. It's a hard question, but I'll turn it over to the group. <laughs> and here, just chime in if you want to say something. I'll start. Um, I I don't think there's a great answer here, Chaotic, if I'm being honest. I don't know how much like advice you can give here. Um, I think it... So for me, I'll just tell you my process. Um, I like to just watch funny things I enjoy and then incorporate that into the game. So if you look at Dad Overboard, it is like 95% Shit's Creek references, right? <laughs> like, um, so that's just, that's one way you can do it. Um, it's okay to be kind of shameless in that way, uh, I think, to sort of like take your inspirations in that way. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, really, it's it's a hard thing to answer because it just depends so much on your own like personality, right? But I think the key though is if you're putting your personality into the mystery, you're probably okay, even if it's not like, you know, quote unquote, haha, funny. Like, it's still gonna like shine through, right? As long as it's like your particular point of view. I don't know. That's my thinking. Yeah, I'll I'll just chime in on there if that's okay. My name's David. Use he him pronouns. Um, and yeah, the um, I think the thing for me is partly for, for me. I think it's it's just like the the kind of the, the mystery shows that I grew up on as well, which did include Murder, She Wrote, but also, um, like, again, a lot of the British sort of crime dramas, like that, or, you know, cosy crime dramas, they do have a very kind of tongue-in-cheek sensibility to them. Even something like Midsummer Murders, all of the characters are very much a kind of pastiche, and I think just kind of having been immersed in that sort of thing, it... it, it it kind of finds a way. I think one of the things that helps maybe, I don't know if helps is the right word, but I think that that kind of guides me in some ways is that that quote, as well as being funny, it's, it's I think it's that sort of sense of funny that's again t telling you something about the character and also sort of breaking the fourth wall a little bit, not in a, obviously not in an overt like um, way, but in a sort of it's, it's, you know, the point for them to say, you know, to give that that quote that says, and this is why you should think that I'm the murderer, because what I've just said is, um, you know, it's clearly a bit weird sort of thing. I just watched an episode of, uh, I'm, I'm restarting Murder, She Wrote for the 19th time, and I just uh, watched episode uh, three, which is the first episode after the two pilot episodes. And something that really struck me about that is how the characters walk right up to Jessica Fletcher and say motives and suspicions. <laughs> like they walk right up to her and they say, well, everyone hated my father. <laughs> you know, like no one's, no one's unhappy, he's dead. You know, like, you know, and there's almost like a, I think you can't, uh, you can't overstate how important like irony is to Brenda Whitney, right? <laughs> like, so it's okay if like, it feels a little like ham handed like that because it'll be okay at the table, right? Um, but yeah, the, the, the characters do just sort of like, like walk up and say all the things Jessica needs to hear, you know, Jim? <laughs> I think one of the other things that's worth remembering is that 90% of these characters, these side characters you come up with, the players are gonna see once for one session and then they're gonna be gone. 
you know, like the deputy and stuff, we think about some of those characters that are ongoing and those characters have to be less one note. They have to be real and have internal lives and stuff like that. But like, if there's a, if like, you should not spend a lot of time on any of those individual characters or get too invested in them because if the players if that hits the table and the players decide yeah we don't we're just not interested in this person you know the other reason you have you know seven to ten is that the players are going to fixate on four or five of them and those will be kind of the ones that 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 stick and so to to you know they don't all have to be funny they don't all have to be serious you know, as long as you've got kind of a smattering of all different kinds, then then you're usually fine, I think. I want to highlight a couple of the comments in the chat too, real quick. Um, Sam writes that uh, this is a good example of where bringing specificity and physical humor into the characterization can make it more fun. I agree completely. Um, that's the kind of thing where sometimes the humor of it is in how it gets played by the keeper, right? And how the players react to it. So, so just give those opportunities. It doesn't have to be like, you know, on the page funny. It could just be funny and how it kind of like shakes out at the table. Um, uh, ben recommends watching programs on HGO, comedy programs. I agree completely. Uh, I will, I'll put in a personal recommendation for um, uh, Hacks, which is stars the lovely Gene Smart, um, which is fantastic and very, very funny. Um, and <laughs> uh, Martin recommends uh, MacGyver, uh, which is, oh wait, is this like a newer MacGyver 2016? The MacGyver I know is from, the 80s and 90s um and it was uh and i think that would probably help you with the tone um anything else about this question before we move on to somebody else's question okay so uh i had somebody in the chat uh sasha who wanted to ask a question hey sasha uh he him and i was just wondering in terms of the suspect side characters what do we think are the best practices in terms of you know, including older suspects from older mysteries like the sheriff or the deputy, or even trying to weave in connections to past suspects, like maybe so-and-so is someone else's daughter who was a suspect in an older mystery. Is that, does that make the town feel smaller, bigger, or does it just open up a can of worms if that connection, you know, died or just wasn't introduced, if, if this group is just playing a campaign? I'll tell you that like uh, our, the official mysteries, uh, we don't do it. Um, and the reason why is because on the reason why we don't do it on the page is because if a group is going to do that, like they'll just do it themselves. They don't need permission from the mysteries to do it. Right. Um, so Sheriff Dalrymple usually shows up again. Right. Um, the, the, the Kraus child who was called out in the establishing question usually shows up again. Etienne Beauregard, like a lot of the early characters like tend to show up over and over again. Dad Overboard is sort of built to do that. Um, but if there's a character that like really stands out to the group, the group will find a way to work it in and they can be a suspect. Um, another reason why we don't do it is because you just never know like what the campaign is going to be like by the time we get to that mystery, right? They, they, there may be a suspect in there that that's a repeat suspect, but they died <laughs> in an earlier mystery, right? And so then it's just like taking up space, right? So, um, that's the sort of official line on it, but, I, but I'm sure if anyone else has any thoughts on it, by all means, I don't want to foreclose those thoughts. <laughs> I know for me personally, when I run the between, since it's the same mystery system, that I do bring in back side characters. But however, in terms of writing mysteries, I don't find that to be helpful. Uh, uh, because like, it, with like uh, new things like you can't predict like every single little detail of, like how like the side characters change even with like recurring characters such as like the uh, the sheriff or what have you even if you bring them in for a second time the way that they can change between mystery and mystery is important and like I've like if it shows up in a mystery I'll like take a look at it but then I would have to like make my no own notes about like how they change and basically write in the margins as it were. Yeah, the only time that we do it, so like in the between, um, there's a couple of mysteries that feature D.I. Pettigrew in the between, mm -hmm. uh, who is kind of our Sheriff Dalrymple equivalent in the between. And I don't, but I just did that as a joke. <laughs> it's just, that's just like my particular sense of humor, like just dropping in D.I. Pettigrew, right? Um, I, you know, I know that it won't always work out great. I think it's a general matter though, you should probably avoid it. And also 
one thing to keep, to keep in mind as well is that like for me like I consider the whole of the setting to be the mysteries that we're playing right and so if you imagined all the mysteries put together like in a book you wouldn't want characters repeated right because it would be like that's you know that would be like a whole setting right and so you wouldn't you wouldn't have repeat entries like that um, I think you nailed yeah. on something there Jason that when I as a consumer when I'm reading through something if I see the same thing show up again I'm less likely to want to use that one because I'm looking for fresh information I'm looking for a yeah. new cast of characters oh, and I think it's just a, I think it's just a uh, I think it's just for like coherency too right like you're just gonna end, you, you could just end up in a situation where like it doesn't uh it doesn't feel coherent with what's been going on in the campaign right I, and, it, and it just might kind of feel a little off um yeah um, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, and I was just going to say, kind of going back to, to what Jim said earlier, I know certainly when I've been running the game before, I have had in um, one of the the uh, one of the, the mysteries we were running, where the players did ask, it's like, are we okay to like think that one of the characters from a previous uh, mystery is involved in this? And it's like, yeah, sure, cool. It's like, if if, <laughs> if you think they're involved, then then run with that. So I think it is something that, like I said, will come up um, um, regardless or can come up regardless, um, uh, like I said, from that, that interest from the players themselves. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, okay, any other questions? We've still got plenty of time. Uh, go ahead, Sam. So in um, Exit Stage Death, you have this section where, you know, if the pallid mask is marked, there's this extra um, moment that happens and that's in the, you know, presenting the mystery section. So I guess I was just wondering, um, if you have advice on those, if you think that they should be, um, like restricted to the standard mysteries, or if you think you could use a pallid mask or, you know, avoid crown, uh, in a sweeps mystery and kind of how you, it's a, it's a fabulous question. That. Yeah. It's a fabulous question. And if you look at my other game, the between the threats do that a lot more, right? Like it's very, prominent thing in that game. Uh, I love it, you should do it, and, and, and here's why, why it works. Um, so the crown of the void, which is what the pallid mask refers to, they have those little bolded titles under each entry precisely for this reason. So that you can, when you're writing your mystery, it's like a common thing all the mavens have, right? Uh, in the other game, the between, even though the details are different, the names of each of the Mask of the Future, which is the equivalent part of the character sheet, it, the names are the same, right? The pomegranate, or no, it's a uh, the chaotic. What are they? Uh, the cosmic passage, the, uh, the 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 various doorways, right? Uh, th that's the same, so that you so that anybody writing a mystery or a threat can like has like a common element on the character sheet that they can tap into. So yeah, you absolutely should do it. It's a great way of making your mystery stand out. And um, because like, I can't emphasize enough, like how you should like really have fun in that first part of the, of the mystery. Like it is your chance to really, really do something cool and special with your, with your mystery um, because the rest of it's just structured stuff. Right. Um, and so, but yeah, that's that. Yeah. So like one thing you can do is, um, the pallid mask is great because it because it implies a certain thing about the characters them being focused on death. Um, one of the options on the crown of the uh, the crown of the void is um, a shadow in the garden, right? And a shadow in the garden like makes mysterious supernatural things happen in the background of the character's life, and so you can work that right into the presentation of the mystery. If a maven has a shadow in the garden marked this happens in the scene, right? You can totally do that. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I strongly, strongly recommend it. Um, I don't know if anything else has to be said about it, but if anybody has any thoughts, by all means. I, I wanted to, sorry, I see Ben was going to talk. But, oh, no, no, um, go ahead, also, go ahead, just kind of like along with this question, do you think that a similar mechanism would be interesting to apply to specific Maven moves being in play, perhaps? Um, I would normally say yes, except okay. that it, because of the Kickstarter and things we know that are happening in the Kickstarter, the Maven yeah. moves themselves are changing, right? Like we're okay. having like a new set of them and stuff. Um, right. I, 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 I usually recommend like the things that are common to all the character sheets and that never change. And the Mask of the, or not, I'll just say Mask of the Future, the Crown of the Void is a great example. Um, okay, cool. 
you might be able to do things with like cozy activities. Some of the cozy activities are like in, in GBBO, it's like if you're the, if you have baking as a cozy activity or whatever, you know, um, that's so play with it. Like don't feel restricted by any means. Um, and if you want to do a Maven move, I think that's okay too, because there's certain ones that are, you know, very likely to be picked like Fox Mulder comes up a lot, Dale Cooper, but you do limit yourself a little bit just because there are so many Maven moves and you know, mm-hmm. and the chances of it being in play are a lot smaller than one of the crowns of the void. Uh, ben, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh, you're muted, Ben. We can't hear you. Or you have not either, or you have not joined audio. <laughs> it's one or the other. <laughs> On the lower left screen, there should be a join audio button. I'll give you a moment to find that. Are there any other comments about this? In terms of uh, uh, coming up with like tying in moves or what have you, you don't have to necessarily tie in a move, but rather as a tie in a crown and then make a move around that just so like things can function the way you want it to make. Like, uh, like for example, like uh, I'm more familiar with the between than Brindlewood Bay, but I know in uh, the between like one of the mysteries like you like unlocked as a reward uh sort of uh demonic influence uh sort of thing but ever to have access to the move you have to like uh mark the darkened threshold to use it so you could do something like that yeah i think if you if you want to go especially for a sweep sweep mystery exit stage death is not a sweep sweep mystery but it it's pretty close to a sweep sweep mystery. It existed before there was the concept, frankly, um, but it's really similar uh, in a lot of ways. And that's a great one to look at if you want to see like how to really like put a lot of supernatural stuff in the beginning, right? To how to like make it work and use custom moves and uh, right, the, the, writing custom moves is beyond the scope of this workshop, but I'm happy to chat about that anytime anybody wants to chat about it, so. Um. And I'll just uh, take Ben's comment here. Uh, ben says, I would just say that the different aspects of the Crown of the Void have different thematic territory, true. Uh, emphasizing different moments in the original story of Persephone, that's also true. Also, they work as a clock and increase in intensity. You know, so you can make a moment more out of uh, more out of reach, the lower along the rung of the aspects of the Crown of the Void you get. Yeah, I like that a lot too. And I'd also say you can, I recommend if you're going to do something like this where you really fiddle with the crown of the void and, and, and work that stuff in, you put a note on your mystery that says this is meant to be played at a certain point in the campaign, right? Just so that you increase the chances someone actually has done the thing. Like if you put, if you do that and like, and someone plays that first, it's not going to, you know, it's going to not have any salience. So any other questions? Uh, okay. Other Ben. <laughs> Um, this is just a quick, like, practical Void Clues question. Um, I'm wondering about, uh, you know, things that might happen in one location or another location, if you have a couple of, you know, different areas going on in your mystery. Um, how universally applicable versus location restricted would you expect something weird? To so the be? second hour is going to be Clues and Void Clues, so we'll talk about it um, then, sorry. I think. Uh, no, it's okay, yeah. Uh, okay. We'll just, for this hour, yeah. we'll, we'll return to it, though, if I don't mention it. In my, in my Sounds words. good, no problem. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, go ahead, Amanda. Um, sorry, there might be a little bit of background noise here. Uh, when I know in industries like this, there tends to be a large cast of characters, and we've already talked about the three descriptive things to make sure that each character seems unique and sort of full. When you're introducing characters, do we have any hot tips on how to make them feel like suspects, but also not be leading uh, for the players? Question mark? <laughs> well, say, that, say that again, like one more time. Thinking, um, we we have the descriptive the descriptive characters or the descriptions for the characters. Sorry, I've only had one cup of coffee, and we have things like their quotes to give off their motives and how they approach the world, et cetera, et cetera. We have this large cast of characters who could all be responsible for whatever bad thing has happened. How? How do people 
um, uh, this is for the whole group. How do you go about approaching it so that the characters all seem like they feel like suspects without feeling like you're leading the players on in a specific like railroady way? Yeah, any thoughts? Make them, oh, go ahead, Jim. I honestly never worry about that because those introductions and those things that you give the players are, are tiny little capsules and different players are going to pick up on different stuff. You're going to do the thing that you think is like so totally obviously you're pointing them straight at that person and the table will go, well, it can't possibly it be won't that matter. person. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> like, yeah. like really, I mean, like, like, I'm, I, like I completely understand that impulse, but in play, if you play a bunch of it, you'll find that like it, it is just literally a thing you don't need to worry, worry about at all. Like as long as you give, you know, if you follow that formula, the players will just inevitably form their own conclusions that have nothing to do with how you think you presented it or wrote it or any of that kind of thing. So like, like that's one of those emergent things that will just that the players will just bring to the table that I honestly think you like you should not fret about. I agree. And I, I would also, as a slightly tangential thought, but a, but an interesting thought, I think, is that um, I, I have this like theory of like scenario writing, at least the way we do our scenarios in Gauntlet publications, which I call like, I call it the blooming flower theory of scenario writing. And people who've listened to my podcast know what this is. But the idea is you can't put, you, you can't make things too, like it's impossible to make something too obvious or to like to, get, to be too heavy handed with your themes. Your goal as an RPG writer is to pack in all the stuff really tightly. All the campy characters, all the like heavy handed themes, all the like, all the like weird little details. Like you just go for it, put it all in there because when the players start to play it, uh, the flower blossoms and the petals spread and, and there's, it all gets kind of like, uh, because there's a lot of like inner, you know, between those moments, there's lots of table talk, there's lots of other things going on, there's dice rolling happening. Like the, what to you feels like really like direct and maybe even a little heavy handed is in play will not feel that way. It will feel very, very opened up, right? And it'll feel very natural. That's just the nature of the medium that we're working in, right? Uh, so that's one thing. I just wanna kind of throw that in there. Uh, any other comments though, generally about making the side characters or the suspects too, um, too, too, too much the suspect, I guess? Uh a good way to make people suspicious of someone is to ma make them a little bit dislikable. Just like, like it doesn't like they don't have to do anything suspicious. Just be like obnoxious. Like uh, that's the uh, way I'm like, going with one of my sub uh, su suspects. He's like a barbecue dad, short and stocky, really obnoxious, and like he's like. He knows like all the down low gossip, but like he refuses to talk about like the murder victim. And like, so like, and I give no reason why he just doesn't do it. And so and like, he's doing his own little side investigation. So he's like, that's just suspicious, suspicious. Just like, why is he doing that? We just don't know if that's all right. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with the oh, either making characters very obnoxious or, or, or trying to make them likable. I think it can go either way. But um, the other thing that I wanted uh, that I think is kind of uh, something to consider as well is kind of how the mystery gets introduced. Um, so like with the um, uh, with one of my mysteries, the long dark detail of the soulless. Um, that is very like explicitly set up to play out like an Agatha Christie story. So you have all of the side characters introduced before the murder even happens. So you kind of get a, a bit of a, a you know a, a little vignette of them before the before the murder takes place. Um, so you kind of know they're all around and present sort of thing. But I think just not my mic. But yeah, I think if you, you there's also kind of the approach where if you want to make it feel a bit more, sometimes you want to kind of reward players for looking into things and like not make all of the side characters like immediately present and like oh you know if you go looking you can find you know the illegitimate daughter who's who's you know um running the the local bakery or whatever and and i think that's that's another way of doing it as well is 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 like it's it's often i mean often like the introducing all the characters at the outset is like the quickest way of getting them all on on the 
on the murder board, as it were. But sometimes you do just want to have those those characters where it does take the Mavens a little bit of work to find out that that character um, exists, sort of thing. Fantastic, thank you. There's uh, a yeah. there's if, if anybody's interested, there's a lot of really really good uh, information on that question in the chat as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, so, there's a lot going on in the chat. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot happening. It's really awesome. Thank you, everybody. Uh, overthinking things is my forte, so I appreciate the tips. <laughs> there is a question in the chat that I want to go ahead and address. Um, it's a quick one. Uh, but basically asking about the origin and idea behind sweep sweep mysteries, which I think is a good question. So if you are not from America or the United States of America, um, you may not understand this concept. So it's it, it, network television in the US back in the 80s and 90s, especially, would have what was called sweeps week. And sweeps week was when they would get their ratings, like the, the ratings group would like measure who was watching the show and then that's determines how much they get paid for commercials and so they really want people to watch their shows on that week that is the week they want everyone to tune in and so what they would do for sweeps week is they would do stunt episodes of your favorite show episodes that take the characters into new places episodes that change your expectations so that people would talk about it and want to watch it right and so that is the idea behind sweeps week mysteries because brindlewood bay of course is a, is a metaphorical TV show, right? And so it, these are mysteries that take place not in the town of Brindlewood Bay, they're somewhere else in the world. And they have, they're not necessarily a murder, they can be any kind of mystery, not necessarily a murder. And they usually have a more supernatural forward thing. And importantly, they are side stories. They are not part of the main Midwives of the Fragrant Void campaign. Okay, so that's, those, that's kind of the the thing, but 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 conceptually, the idea is they are essentially like jump the shark stunt episodes of Brindlewood Bay. <laughs> right? So uh, that's the way to think about them. Uh, Jim, do you have a question? No, I just want to point out that that e that episode of Happy Days was in fact a sweeps week episode of Happy Days, yep. <laughs> and so that that's where that whole thing comes the from. Jumping the so, shark thing, yeah, comes from. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so all right, it, we've got like 10 ish minutes still. So any other questions about this section? And if you, if I missed you in the chat, just put it in the chat again for me. Looks like we maybe do not then. Oh, <laughs> Matthew, um, I will, I, I think while we're just, since we have a little bit of time, I'll cut, maybe read some of these like follow up comments about, um, about the suspects. So, Sasha notes, I like to make the victims so the un so unlikable the mavens wish they did them in first. That's yeah, that's a thing. That's usually the case. That's the classic Mr. Body thing from Clue, right? Um, Matthew says players will always inject their own stuff. So you really, yeah, and I agree. I think this is the real key. You, it's okay if like, because like I said, just in, in Murder She Wrote, characters will walk right up to Jessica Fletcher and be like, "This is why I might have done it." <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it's 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 pretty amazing actually. Um, Let's see, we also have a comment. Matthew says, there's a certain level of trust that you, the writer, need to have in players. That is true. Also, this really cuts down on your amount of work and helps get things down to that uh, one page, it's actually a two page format in some of the mysteries. Um, let's see, Martin says, this is exactly where traditional mystery RPGs fail so often. They try to handhold the players and uh, tend to, and even then they tend to fall out of the railroad. Um, Oh, this is an interesting one. Matthew says, maybe give a suspect an innocuous secret, something they're ashamed of, but has nothing to do with the mystery that creates either a red herring or the mavens uh, for the mavens, or they do in fact find out it's related to the mystery. That's that's an interesting approach. Um, yeah, uh, I mean the players will give meaning to whatever that is, uh, but but yeah, that's that's a good way of introducing texture to the characters for sure. Um, oh, Sam has an interesting thought. You can also put the secrets in the clues section so that way the keeper can apply them to whichever characters the players are gravitating toward. I, I like that too. Yeah, I do that sometimes. Um, fantastic. Let's see if we have any questions. Oh, we got another question here. Um, Martin asks, why is the why is seven the minimum number of characters? Um, I just think it's a good, I, I, I do this thing called, I have this old philosophy of role-playing games that some people might know called 731. And the idea is you have seven things that people can interact with. Uh, each of those seven things has three details. 
and one way of embodying them. And that's, it, it kind of comes from that. Like seven is just kind of a good number for like variety in a session of a role-playing game, whether that be seven rooms, seven locations, seven people, seven is, is tends to work pretty well. Um, okay, so Victor, you had a question about Sweet Sweet Mysteries, go for it. Oh uh, yes, uh, Victor from Venezuela, uh, pronounce he him. Um, I do have a, a question about the, like, what's the ideal resolution uh, for a sweeps week mystery? In this case, it's like an experience. Well, like, I, I know the origin of the of this uh, kind of mysteries, but is it supposed to be like an experience, like, like uh, it's a side quest of sorts? Uh, but what's the ideal resolution for one such uh, mystery? Uh, I haven't run one. I haven't watched one yet on, on stream, but I'm really curious. I'll just, uh, I'll just read one to you. Um, so in the Hex Files, which is by Donna Giltrap, the in that one, the Mavens have found, uh, they are going to a convention uh, in New Mexico. Uh, it's New Mexico that looks suspiciously like Vancouver. And it they find a car on the side of the road that has two uh, unusually attractive dead FBI agents in it. And they find their files, okay? And they, they, the files are about missing people in a nearby town of Devilwood. And so what they're, they're, what they're investigating, it, it, and, and it says, there's a section, we'll talk about this in the third hour, but it says solving the mystery. To solve this mystery, the Mavens will need to discover what has been happening to the missing travelers and ideally put a stop to it. So that's the idea. It can just be, it can, uh, I think another one of the sweep sweep mysteries is, um, they go to Canada to meet Robin Masterson, the secret the writer of the Amanda Delacourt novels. And, uh, but it's a, in a remote town that's being uh, terrorized by a Bigfoot type cryptid creature, right? And so they have to figure out, or they should figure out like, what is really going on here? Like, is there actually a cryptid? Is it something else? So, yeah, uh, but that's, that's kind of the idea. Uh, any other questions for this hour? Or just comments or thoughts as well? Uh, in terms of sweeps uh, week mysteries, it's, it's a little bit helpful to think of it as rather having the murder mystery, the question that has the complexity is who do, who done it? Uh, that's pretty much for Brindlewood Bay as standard. However, sweeps weeks, the question can be a little bit more open-ended, such as like as we've seen in the between where it, the between has like multiple questions and it's very complex, but it's still for sweeps week, it doesn't get to that level, but it's a little bit more complex, if that makes sense. Yeah, the uh, sweeps week existed. The idea was invented before the between was, uh, or at least as part of the between was finalized. And if I had to go back and do it, I would probably make it a little bit more like the way the between does it, because the between asks specific questions and that you have to answer. Uh, that's basically how sweeps week mysteries work. It's just not quite as formalized. But, um, but the idea is just to expand the nature of the mystery to beyond murder, right? So any other comments or questions? Uh, Carl, he, him, could you expand on the, the 731? You said the one was a one way to embody it. Is that oh, what yeah. Well, so I don't think this necessarily applies to to Brindlewood Bay. I was just answering that one question, but right, right, as a general I... matter, yeah, as a general matter, like in prep or in writing, I like to do, uh, uh, seven things. So whether that be locations or people, just seven things that the players can interact with. Uh, each of those seven things has three descriptive details, like the suspects, right? Like three sensory details. And then the one is a way to embody that thing. So a manner of speech, uh, a noise that the keeper can do at the table or some kind of like little thing they can do to embody it. Um, this is just my old, old, old religion rpg writing advice uh from way back when um but but it uh but but, but elements of that are definitely in the brindlewood bay structure so yeah but that's the seven three one seven things three descriptive details one way for the gm to embody at the table yeah and and, and thank you amanda has a blog post i wrote a blog post about it which is linked there in the chat any other questions or thoughts uh, for the 731 method, uh, just to continue on to like, because you do like orchestrate it even in like the writing of Brindlewood Bay Mysteries yeah. of like, you have seven locations. Yeah. 
uh, and, and like typically when you introduce a location, you gave uh, like a few, like three descriptions well, so and then I'll, doing a paint the scene. Yeah, well, so here's the thing. Uh, this is actually worth talking about. Um, in the between, that's the way it works. The locations mm -hmm. have the three descriptive details. They actually yeah. don't in Brindlewood Bay. It's just the paint ah. the scene question. But uh, this is brand new information for everyone here. Uh, we are going back to every mystery in Brindlewood Bay and changing the locations to have Ooh. the three descriptive details and then putting in the question. So that is a thing that's happening for the final Kickstarter release. But um, uh, but but, it, but to, to kind of emphasize your point that yes, it's a good way of doing it. <laughs> we, we agree. <laughs> so, um, and also characters, have, characters have three details and the quote, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's all, it's all seven, three, one, ultimately, even if the numbers are not exactly right, it's more or mm -hmm. less the same idea. Um, okay. I think we're probably pretty good for the first hour then. Why don't we go ahead and take a five minute break and we'll come back and do the second hour where we will talk about uh, paint the scene uh, locations and clues and void clues. I'll see you in five. Okay, this is hour two. In hour two, I'm gonna talk about paint the scene, AKA locations, uh, clues, and void clues. So for locations, how many? Well, uh, between three and six, depending on complexity. But again, more is fine. Uh, if you think you need more locations in there and you've got the word count, by all means, go for it. The paint the scene technique. I, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this. And I promise you, the judges are gonna pay attention to this. Uh, so I recommend understanding it well. Paint the scene is a technique that I devised uh, about six or seven years ago. It's a GM technique. And now it exists formally in the game, Brindlewood Bay and in between. Um, the idea is the characters enter a location or a space. And then as the keeper, you present a question to the players at a player level usually. You present a question to the players that helps explore the idea, an idea about the space, right? So what paint the scene is not is tell me what you see. That is not what paint the scene is. That's just asking what do you see. Paint the scene is tell me what you see that reinforces an idea about this place. That's what paint the scene is. And so examples um, from Dad Overboard, I, I think the classic example there is when they first get to the yacht of the family. Um, the question is, what do you see that shows these people have more money than they know what to do with, <laughs> right? And so everyone thinks about it and then they start saying what they see, right? Well, maybe they have statuary on the deck. Maybe they have a built-in pool, you know, on one level, that kind of thing, right? Everything is in brass and gold, right? In play, I think it's really important to understand like how it works in play. In play, what's happening, in role-playing games, we have this like basic problem in the medium where we have a group of people and we have to meld their minds together, right? <laughs> we have to like merge their head cannons, right? And so paint the scene is an attempt to do that because what, when you, the keeper poses the question, everyone starts to think and starts to form their own ideas about what they think the location is like, right? But they also have to speak and they're speaking on a thing that reinforces a key idea. And so as everyone speaks and offers up their thoughts, everyone is starting to get on the same page about what this location is like. And importantly, they understand it at a thematic level, which also operates on a subconscious level because because it just does. <laughs> I don't know why, but it just does. If everyone, because suddenly you're also think you're now thinking about like, well, these people are rich, so that has a lot, a big effect on how they interact with the world, how I interact with them, and um, and so that's really the power of the technique. It is a it's a specific thing that keeper gets to do to really engage the players. The players buy into the moment. They get to create their own head cannon. They get to share their head cannon, and they get to explore an idea. Um, examples. Let's have some non Brenda Wood Bay examples, actually, because I think it helps emphasize the, the meaning. I love to do this one uh, when I'm playing a fantasy game and that and they're going into a place that is the home of, say, a Medusa, right? You say, what do we see in this villa that tells us it is the home of a Medusa, right? And now everyone gets to think about what is a Medusa? Well, what do Medusas do? Well, 
They turn people to stone with their gaze. So maybe they have all the mirrors covered up <laughs> so that they don't do that accidentally. Or maybe there are statues all over the place <laughs> of people who they turn to stone. Maybe every maybe there's snake motifs and a player describes all the various weird snake architecture, right? That is what um, that's what paint the scene is, right? It is world building, it is idea exploration, and it is also just the set dressing of the moment, right, of the scene. And so when you are thinking about paint the scene questions, when you are writing your paint the scene questions for locations, first of all, you got to come up with the key locations. The locations are they don't have to be places that the mavens will necessarily visit, but they should be places that the mavens will most likely visit, right? And you can point them in that direction in the presentation as well, right? Like you can kind of say, okay, these are the three or four places that you're probably gonna have to go look for things, right? Um, the locations can be kind of generic. Um, so if we look at my other game, The Between, some of those threats, the locations are not specific places. They're more just like ideas of places. So a, um, a, a brothel or a, a block of flats, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, or they can be very specific, a specific ice cream parlor, a specific um, business or a home or something like that. But importantly, it should, be, it, should, it should give the possibility of like a place that the mavens might go look, right? And I think what's worth emphasizing here, just big picture, this is true for the entire mystery. This is not the whole of the stuff, right? <laughs> like, like these are not necessarily all of the characters and all the locations. To some degree, your mystery is a highly focused, a highly focused like in set of inspirations and a toolbox or a toy box for the GM, for the keeper, right? Like because they're gonna take it, they're gonna read it and they're gonna have their own ideas. Like, oh, these places are cool. And I bet there's also a place like this. And so they'll come up with their own thing, right? And um, so that's another thing to consider as well. You don't have to make sure everything is accounted for, but the stuff that you do put in there, you highlight its specialness with the paint the scene question, right? So, or for the suspects, you highlight the specialness with the quote, right? So that is a, um, that's a thing to keep in mind. Um, Paint the scene is a big idea in the game. Uh, I know the judges are going to be like, uh, when it comes to, because they're judging on creativity, uh, their uh, creativity, uh, quality of writing, and uh, playability. And paint the scene is a big playability question, right? So, uh, so bear that in mind. Okay, let's move on to clues. I bet you have lots of questions about clues. So, clues. How many? Uh, 20. <laughs> it's always 20. Some guidelines for clues. I think there should be a variety of clue types. Um, so conversations overheard, forensic details in the environment, like bloody carpets and bullet casings and shattered Britty awards, that kind of thing, right? There should be documents. Wills are a big one for murder mysteries. Unpaid bills are a big one for murder mysteries, that kind of thing. Uh, confessions of anger or passion or conversations between characters, I already mentioned that have a variety of things, things that can be spoken about, things that can be found, things that can be read, things that can be researched. Um, so that's that's point one, variety. It should be something, a clue should be something that a maven would notice. An old boot is a terrible clue. It's a really bad clue. An old boot caked in mud is a better clue because at least it implies something, right? <laughs> like, okay, it's caked in mud, so maybe it was recently used or went outside or whatever. An old boot caked with mud found in an unusual place. That's a that's the best clue, right? Or you can even like say what that unusual place is, right? I like to keep it a little open personally, but you can you can help the keeper out by saying an old boot caked with mud found in the pantry, right? You, like you can you can do that. Um, the key though is is it something the mavens would notice, right? If it's just an innocuous thing in the environment that they wouldn't notice, it's not a good clue. Um, it has to be something that would stand out. I think that about a fourth of the clues, this is not precise, but three or four or so should strongly suggest certain suspects or certain outcomes, right? This is important because sometimes the keeper just needs that, okay? Like sometimes the, sometimes the group needs it, right? Um, it is occasionally helpful to just be like, 
well, this clue, uh, you know, like you can kind of, you can say, well, like the clue is like a specific person was cut out of the will. That's a really like thumb on the scales clue, but it's, you kind of want some of those so that the keeper has some options. And so the players are kind of pushed in a certain direction. Uh, it just helps the gameplay a little bit to have those options in there. Um, the keeper can always adjust it as they want, but, but as long as you are kind of like throwing in some possibilities, it's really helpful. Um, the remaining clues should be pretty open-ended in what they mean. You always want to make sure you write the clue in such a way that it's not so specific that it limits how the clue can be incorporated into the scene, right? Um, so I like an old boot caked with mud found in an unusual place because the, 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 the real key detail is the old boot caked in mud, but the unusual place, that gives the keeper the space to put it wherever they think would be kind of cool, right? So if there's been a lot of action at the uh, in the Vidal's you know, Tinseltown room and the All Hollows Scream mystery, an old boot caked with mud would stand out there, right? And so if you put that in there. Um, so you want to write them so that there's a possibility of, you know, they could be kind of used in different ways or twisted around in different ways. Leave some room for keeper adaptation. It's the same idea. Um, so I have a couple of examples from two mysteries. The first one here, a suicide note from years ago preserved as a keep keepsake. This is a highly adaptable clue because the keeper can change lots of different aspects of it, right? It could be a suicide note from years ago, not preserved as a keepsake, but found at the bottom of a drawer, right? Or it could be some other kind of note preserved as a keepsake, right? Um, that is the way keepers will use these things. It's okay for you to say what you think it should be, but as long as there's space for the keeper to do things with it. Another example, a Hawthorne family photo with one member carefully cut out of it. That could be some other family photo with someone cut out of it, or it could be a Hawthorne family photo with a very specific person cut out of it, right? Um, it, that adaptability, that looseness, that openness is good. Void clues, kind of changing tack a little bit here. And void clues only apply to murder mysteries. Void clues are, so in the game, they're not clues that are related to the murder. They have nothing to do with the murder necessarily. They are not, they have no mechanical weight as far as that goes. You do not get a bonus on your roll for working that to theorize. What they are is they're a timer. Um, as the characters uncover void clues, they get closer and closer to their final confrontation with the ultimate antagonists of the story, which is the midwives of the Franklin Void. And so that is sort of their function mechanically in the game. Their function sort of from a storytelling standpoint is they are how that other big part of Brindlewood Bay comes into the story, right? Brindlewood Bay is not just cozy murder mysteries. It is also this supernatural story, this, this occult Lovecraftian story. And void clues are how that happens. Um, it, it is a way of showing that this setting is weird, showing that this setting can be scary. And when you're writing them, uh, don't hold back. <laughs> um, something we discovered really early on when we were asking contributors to help us out writing mysteries is the, the contributors would, um, the authors would, they would restrain themselves on the void, the void clues. They would be too subtle, right? Um, and that is not what you want. I, my personal preference is that the, the void clues be really like they stand out, right? They, they just are, they are like, like go for it, right? The keeper can decide how much they want to, you know, how they want to like, you know, present it or gauge it for the players or whatever, but you should tell the keeper like what the big, cool, scary thing is, right? Um, just look at some of the examples in the, in, in the example mysteries. And I would even say some of the earlier mysteries are not as strong as I would even want. I probably might go change them for the Kickstarter, but, um, but definitely don't hold back. It's another way for your mystery to stand out as well, um, because you, if your murder mystery, at least, because it gives you a chance to kind of, you know, do creepy, cool, creepy shit. People love cool, creepy shit. Um, and always go back to your touchstone theme or idea. So in the Great Brindlewood Bay Bake Off, one of the void clues is a group of gingerbread men, a tray of gingerbread men engaged in uh, lewd acts, right? Like that's a weird detail, but it's really specifically focused on baking, right? So um, that, you know, that, that's, that's even probably one of the more subtle ones to be honest. Um, 
but definitely uh, go for it on the void clues. D don't hold back on that. Um, it, it is the time to really let that that supernatural stuff, uh, that, that supernatural fl flag fly, as it were. Um, okay, so that is everything I have to say about this portion. Let's go ahead and go over to questions about either locations, AKA paint the scene or vice versa and clues and void clues. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, go for it. I'm gonna look at the chat while that happens. Um, I'll look for hands though now. Uh, Carl, again, does the number 20 amount of clues include void clues and other no. clues? Uh, oh. Void clues, there should be about, uh, I don't remember what we do on void clues. I wanna say it's like six maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, six. It's like six, yeah, six. It's usually half like a six, dozen, yeah. Yeah, six void clues and twenty regular clues. Other questions? Hi. Uh, um, uh, go ahead. I don't know who just spoke. Who just spoke? <laughs> sorry, that was me. Okay, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to to reiterate uh, my my misplaced question from last uh, hour about the location of void clues. Uh, some might be more or less location specific. Um, I was wondering whether that's a problem or how to handle that. Uh, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's okay, but I'll let others chime in with their experiences. Yeah, um, I mean, not not much more to say beyond I don't think it matters that much. But yeah, I think that's, that's right. I think, you know, like, obviously, um, um, uh, what's the What's the one from Dead Overboard? It's like all, all like a load of dead fish washing up on the beach or something similar, isn't it? And um, and it's something like that. It's like, yeah, it's obviously it's got to be at a beach. It's not going to happen somewhere that isn't a beach, but that's that that still feels broad enough that you know, you know, you're in Brindlewood Bay. There's there's always a beach not that far away. It's it's sort of something you can always have come in. So I think, like I said, yeah, it's it's good not to not to be like hyper specific I think in terms of like picking something that's only going to happen at one very specific time in one very specific place but outside of that I think um yeah you know it's it's within the realms of like adaptation or um, interpretation with a lot of them yeah and also remember like to some degree your goal when you're writing these mysteries is uh you are presenting the setting of the of Brindlewood Bay right and so you are truly teaching the keeper about the setting with your void clues, right? Um, however they use it is up to them, but it's your, you are kind of teaching them the setting. And so you are, um, you're teaching them about a way to think about the environment. Even if that never specific thing never comes into play, they're thinking about the environment in a certain way, right? So it's, it, it serves that purpose for sure. Any other questions or comments? I'm scrolling through the chat to make sure. Go ahead, Sam. I posted one in the chat, but I'll read them now for. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, two questions. So the first one is um, in a sweeps mystery where there's like this potential for a supernatural outcome. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my clues and finding the balance of like what should lean more heavily supernatural and what should be maybe more like mundane, for lack of a better word. So I was just wondering if there was any input from the group on uh, the right balance for that. I have thoughts, but I'll let others chime in. I can't really speak for anybody else. Um, I haven't actually played Brenda Wood Bay, but I've sort of run it and I ran a fair amount of the between play a fair amount of the between similar. Um, I think that if you leave things kind of vague enough, depending on what the players do, they're going to take it whatever way they want to take it. You could have, for example, in, you know, the threat in the between the St. James Street ghost, there's a vase that fills up with blood. I mean, that's spooky and clearly supernaturally, um, yeah, clearly on the supernatural side of things, but the players could very easily explain it away in a non-supernatural thing. Somebody rigged it up to do that, uh, to scare people or whatever. So I think that if things are, are vague enough, the players are gonna take it whatever way they feel like it anyway Jim yeah and the mere fact that you are writing clues that are explicitly things that are supposed to stand out means that the players can then interpret that as supernatural even if you intend it as completely mundane so that's like another thing where just you know like like if you want the outcome to be roughly a coin flip just do it 50 50 
and the table will figure it out. And if the, you know, if the keeper wants it to lean that way, they'll present eight of those supernatural clues and only three of the mundane ones are the other way around. And, you know, again, that's a thing where like, that is not going to survive getting out of your hands. Like the second you release it into the world, everybody will do what they want with it. So I like, I, I, I think don't just don't sweat it all that much. Yeah, I say don't sweat it too. I, the, I find that sweep, sweep mystery clues are much easier to write than they are murder mystery clues. And between, uh, for the between, the, the clues for that game are much easier to write than Brindlewood Bay murder mystery clues because Brindlewood Bay murder mystery clues have to have, they have to be grounded in a basic uh, mundanity and reality, right? And that actually can be harder to write. Whereas in a sweep sweep mystery or in something for the between, you can write whatever weird shit comes to your brain because the players are going to give it meaning, right? <laughs> because the supernatural is in play. Um, in a murder mystery, you have that tension between the supernatural being in the background, but the foreground is more, you know, mundane, you know, people versus people kind of conflicts. And so the clues have to have, they have to have more of that grounded quality. And so I think, I think they're harder to write in a murder mystery. That's just my opinion. Um, sweepstick mystery, I think is, that's an easier part of the job. So, yeah. But yeah, just, just, I say, go for it. Whatever sounds cool. <laughs> Do that. Um, um, I'm going to, um, I'm with Jim basically, um, but my point is that um, keep in mind that there's a context when you play a, a soup weeks mystery in the fact that it's a bit of uh, the table will have an attitude more like a one shot. Um, so they will know going in if they want something more supernatural or not. So I guess from the point of view of the writer, you should probably choose a, a good balance of clues that lean one way and the other. So uh, the keeper knows, uh, depending on what kind of session they want to play, uh, which one to use and which ones to leave behind. So give them both, basically. Yeah, that's a great point. It, it goes back to what I said in my notes in the beginning, which was like, have about a fourth of the clues imply a certain outcome, right? Um, it's just to help the keeper, you know, essentially kind of give them just a little extra something to direct things if they feel like they want to. Any other comments or responses to this particular question? Go ahead, Victor. Uh, I am reminded when I think of void clues, I am reminded of this quote by uh, Guillermo del Toro, who says like, what generates fear, like in monster design, in, in narrative, uh, it's like the, the presence of what shouldn't be there and the absence of what should be there. So, you know, like I'm thinking like, I don't know, like a reflection or, or somebody who doesn't have any eyes or, 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 or a mouth that isn't there or some kind of hallucination perhaps or just like this negative space that reinforces that it's to me super creepy just thinking about it. Yeah. My favorite void clue that I do uh, from Dad Overboard uh, and that I kind of work into other mysteries too because it works so well is to have the midwife show up in the middle of a completely innocuous scene. They're just there, standing there, statuesque in robes and blank masks, uh, <laughs> just staring at the mavens. That's all you gotta do. And it's like, it's enough. Everyone gets creeped out because it's what, it's what you just said, Victor. It's like the, it's the presence of something that should not be there, right? And then it's the blankness of their faces, that absence that emphasizes the creepy, you know, definitely. So that's, that's a good technique for writing the void clues, especially. and and And, honestly all, all the most of the clues in a sweepstick mystery too like you can kind of go depending on the nature of your mystery you can kind of go in that more bizarro kind of like realm okay i'm looking at questions on the chat before i get too far ahead of ourselves here and uh martin asks what's a good scale level for the locations is quote the port enough or should we go for a, a specific warehouse in the port uh great question i think it just depends on your mystery to be quite honest um it it think about, I mean, it's a, it's a, specificity is a chance to, to sort of like make your mystery stand out a little bit just by having like specific places and locations, but that may not be the right answer for the mystery. Um, it might be that the location is just the docks or the port, right? And that might, that might be enough. Um, it really is, I think it's just kind of comes down to what you want to accomplish. Jim, what do you want to say? 
one of the other things that specificity versus generalization can do for you is make the distinction between public spaces and private spaces, which is an important thing in an investigation for where the mavens have access to the kinds of clues they're going to find there and stuff like that. And I always try to include a mix of those two in any of the mysteries that I'm designing, even if it's like a, you know, like it all happens in an inn. Um, there's the dining room and then there's people's private rooms. And so that public private space thing, you can underline it with that. Yeah, I think when you're when you're thinking of locations, this is really this is especially the case in my other game, the between, but it's the same concept in Brindlewood Bay. Um, the specificity really does depend quite a lot on like what type of mystery it is. So if it is a more closed room bottle mystery, like in Jingle Bell Shock, for example, the locations are just the different rooms, right? Like there's the, the room that's a temple to her little dog. There's a room that's the Christmas room. There's a, her bedroom. Um, and so that's, that's highly specific because it is in a very focused place. But if it's a mystery that's sort of sprawling and goes all over town, like Dad Overboard, uh, the locations are a lot more broad, like the fish market, right? Um, and so, yeah, that, that, that also has a big effect on it. Like, what is the scope of the mystery itself, right? That determines the scope of the locations in the mystery. Um, any other thoughts or questions? Go ahead, Amanda. Uh, just to add on to that, and again, this is, a, I'm using references from the between because I know that one a little bit more. Um, you can have very, very small places and using those location descriptions, you can make it feel bigger. You can make it feel fuller, um, especially if you go and and really make use of the paint the scene. I'm thinking of the uh, the threat in uh, the between, um, the, the beetle threat, uh, which is all basically, the location is one room. It's just a small apartment and all the locations are different areas within that room, but it feels, it's, it's a bottle mystery in a way, but it feels full, even though it's just this small location because of being um, those descriptions of the different locations within the room and the paint the scenes thing. So I think it can be used to, to great effect. Well, and when you, when you name something, when you name a location, when you, when you, when you do that, you are also highlighting the importance of that location right in the story like by just the, the mere act of making it an important by, by naming it on the sheet highlights its importance in the story which i think is another thing to keep in mind as well like if you're just trying to think of random places to put in there to fill seven or to fill five spots or whatever that's maybe not the best way to do it like think about like well what are the what are the important things that i really want to stand out here you know any other questions or comments uh in terms of uh just like when do you separate the papacy locations? I find it best is when the a significant scene change happens, such as like you can have a very a sprawling space such as the porch, but have the scene just continue on within that space, even though the location quote changes this the feel of the situation doesn't change. That's what the paint scene really shines at. It changes the mood kind of a related question in the comments from sam in situations like in the tea time of the solace where a location always triggers the night move is that included in the paint the scene section or somewhere else um i think it's up to you uh wherever you want to put it wherever it makes the most sense for the keeper i don't i don't actually remember how it works in tea time of the solace david i don't know if you where is um, that I, I was actually just just checking it over today to make <laughs> sure i wasn't self-plagiarizing myself uh which happens often um but um yeah i i think in that i did just like put a note at the you just put a note at the, the end of the of the yeah. location yeah yeah that's that's the right way. that's it's a great technique though by the way it's another way of highlighting the importance of a location right like like there's no better way of signaling to the keeper this is a cool important place than giving it a special rule <laughs> right like it has its own rules right so you can totally do that um, that's 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 allowed um matthew has a question here on the chat what about a mystery with no void clues? Could this suggest a distinct lack of midwives in this place or event? Would that mechanically impact the game negatively? Um, I don't know. I have never... Tr if it's a murder mystery without void clues, I am not 100% sure. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the Mavens is such an important part of the experience. So I, uh, it's like to not have it is like not the game I wrote. Um, but I don't, but it, I mean, would it work? It would totally work. Like, it's not like a mechanical problem. It's more of just like a goals 
uh, issue, I suppose. Amanda, do you have any thoughts on that? I feel like the way that the um, the midwives work is they have their fingers in everything. That's sort of the overarching idea uh, that I get from Brindlewood Bay. So having a, a murder mystery where they don't have any, there's nothing especially if it's about the town, midwives. Right? It yes. seems, yeah. it just seems really, that's a side story, not a Brindlewood Bay mystery. Does it might be a sweep sweep mystery, right? I mean, a sweep sweep yeah. mystery does not have void clues, right? And it can still be a murder. It's just a different framing. Uh, so the answer is yes, it's, it's perfectly fine to do. If you intend for it to be in Brindlewood Bay, though, if it's a murder in Brindlewood Bay that has nothing to do with the midwives, that stands out as kind of weird. So, yeah. Yeah, I think my kind of my kind of read on that, uh, you know, kind of looking at it from the point of view, not so much of as writing it, but as of running it, would be that I would probably, if if it was still being run as part of the standard midwives conspiracy campaign, and there weren't any void clues given in the threat itself. I would probably take that as an invitation to either invent some of my own or draw them from an existing mystery uh, rather than not use that mechanic in the game um, as well, it were. Because you also it's, run into the issue of like some of the moves implicate void clues, right? So like, exactly, yeah. It, it's a, yeah. And in sweep sweep mysteries, that's accounted for in a lot of ways, but like in just a regular murder mystery, it's not. So it might be kind of odd. But, uh, let's, um, any other questions? Go ahead, Ben. Um, I just had a quick comment on that, which is I mean, something you could do if you really wanted a location or something that was out of the reach of the midwives somehow is, I mean, you could theoretically write a location in which you might not find void clues, but even then, I don't know, that, that does sort of change things. It would have to be a very important location. I'm, I'm just, what, what immediately jumped into my head was if you would receive a void clue whilst here, uh, add an item to your cozy little place or something like that, you know, would, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's a cool idea. I like it. I would also add, like, I could see this working, but not with the current conspiracy as is, because, like, imagine, like, having, like, a sort of a body show up in Brindlewood Bay that the midwives aren't involved in and then going to the mavens for help solving this case because this, this is not their problem. Yeah, I could actually see if you frame it up right, Matthew. I think if you frame up such a mystery in the beginning and you put in the presentation part, you put this mystery is meant to be played after layer number x is unlocked in the dark conspiracy and then you talk about the specific reasons why there are no void clues i think as long as you lay it out appropriately for the keeper um because like you don't want that mystery to come up early in a campaign right that definitely feels like a mid to late campaign kind of mystery um i like chaotic's idea of like the midwives actually come to the mavens and say we didn't have anything to do with this one <laughs> right or like we're, we're there's no connection at all to what we're doing with that is that that murder right that would be pretty funny um it might kind of mess with the tone a little bit but it kind of depends on your own campaign i suppose um but it's not impossible i i it, it definitely but it's definitely it's not like quite as the game is written it's not quite what the game assumes so uh other questions go ahead jonah Hi, uh, Jonah, he, him. I've been thinking about as sort of like adding optionality and like a, the, the option of complexity and depth within locations and clues and void clues. And I started thinking about it because of long, dark tea time, where one of the locations is the cave system. And up until that point, when you read it, there's no mention of anything about caves. No one is secretly in the caves. There's no nothing. And then you get to that location and you're like, huh. And when we did it, it added 90 minutes to the game and added a lot of depth and complexity. But it also felt like if I was trying to keep it short, I just wouldn't bring up the caves. You know, it, it, it really was something that made me think about. It was a very specific idea that gave so much choice to the keeper in that situation. And I was wondering if any of you had had thoughts about a similar kind of thing 
um, that, or if you're experimenting with writing or, or seen it in something that's like, if I use this, it adds an hour. And if I don't, it's a lot more concise, but I love the possibility of adding an hour with this thing that suddenly becomes very integral, but also doesn't need to be there at all to give it a very solid experience. I'll just say that like my experience with long dark tea time which is uh of all the mysteries i didn't write is my favorite and um i you are correct like that mystery is can be really hard to do in one session because if they go to the caves it changes it changes everything right like the the, the mystery like the tone changes like everything changes and i think that's what david intended um but yeah anybody have any thoughts on like that like the possibility of locations like expanding the scope of the mystery even so it kind of kind of sounds like what you're saying jonah uh with my own experience with uh writing mysteries i accidentally walked into that one with uh my own threat for the between uh for the previous writing contest that took a lot of sessions because i put in a sort of pseudo side threat alongside with it in which it created so many like branching like complications that it ended up like ha just changing up the entire dynamic of the game and introduced like quite a few characters even though it all stemmed really from one particular location and one particular uh side character it just and like also with a uh, particular mascot pulls with the uh, uh the mask of the gilded door i believe um it's, it's for the between right yeah so yeah so it's like you would have, like i think like people have to be careful about like what types of lore it gets revealed at certain places such as like what types of already dark and supernatural things are out there? What sorts of things are associated with the midwives? It's even though you're like, oh, this would just like add like 20 minutes. It's, it's just a fun little excursion. Uh, no, it like it's probably going to add a lot more because pe players just love to delve into like weird stuff. So the weirder it is, the longer it's going to be played out. I think for contest purposes, you should do it though, right? Like for the purposes of the contest, you should absolutely explore that territory, right? I mean, because um, part of the reason why I love long, 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 dark, long, dark tea time so much is because David takes the established setting of Brindlewood Bay, especially the history of the midwives that's in the, or the history of the town that's in the dark conspiracy sheet, and incorporates elements of that into the mystery. There are other mysteries too, like Petra Volkhausen's mystery, um, Deadly Silent Auction. That one like uh, grabs onto certain historical aspects that are established in the town and expands upon them in the mystery. I think that's a great approach. Like um, if you like one of the historical notes about the town is when, um, when, when the commune showed up in the 60s, right? And then the locals chased them out. A mystery that touches on that would really enrich the whole experience, right? And um, and I and I, I think it's something you should consider in, your, in writing your mystery. Like if you really want your, if you want your mystery to feel really integral to the setting of Brindlewood Bay, that's a great way of doing it. Um, and that, that's why Long Dark Tea Time is one of my favorites because it feels so integrated into the history of the town. And um, and that makes it just a little bit more special for me when I'm running my games so that I, I like to, I like to, I like to throw that one on the table at a like kind of mid campaign when the group is starting to really like get into the history of the place and then you do long dark tea time or you do deadly silent auction or you do the whale one the whaling museum one those really really like get into the history of the town and they feel heightened and special and they make the campaign feel really like substantial right so uh worth doing i think i would say yeah, I think as well to the the that that sort of wider point um, that that you made, Jenna. I think as well what I find is that a lot of that as well to me isn't even so much necessarily just locations. I think locations can do that because obviously they just physically expand 
the the scope of the threat but i think just as well um certainly having like run it as well the links between characters um and that sort of thing can can really you can get into that as well where, where i think if you even without like writing tons and tons of, of like words on it i think you can imply a lot of complex relationships between all the different characters in a mystery and if the players start really getting into that that can lead things sort of spiraling off and i mean i just remember the first the first um game the first mystery i ran was um great brindlewood bay bake off um and that was one of those sort of classic ones where by the time we got to the end of it and again that classic like you know midsummer murder style thing they decided that most of the clues they'd actually found were red herrings because it was all the complicated relationships between the various different side characters and what was going on between them which made them initially suspicious until they decided oh okay that wasn't actually a motive for murder that was just their deal um and and so i think that, that that's that sort of plays into the idea as well that idea of the kind of expanding out and, and how how much either you as a you as a keeper or the players themselves delve into um grappling with those sort of um additional questions and or, you know, not not capital Q questions but those like yeah just additional theories and and um and and goings on I'm catching up with the chat and uh Sarah did you still have a question from chat? uh I had asked for clarity on when you uh were telling us that about a quarter of the clues should strongly implicate one of the suspects. For clarity, they should not all point to the same suspect. The oh, no, guy. no, a variety. Yeah, thank you. That's a good clarifying question. Um, a variety of like outcomes, right? Whether that be like this person did it or this is what's really going on or this is really about uh, this is really about an estate dispute and not about this other thing. Like, like clues that like kind of point in a certain direction and not all the same right like diff like like options for the keeper definitely yeah thank you that's a good question good to clarify uh questions or comments try to see hands let me check the chat <laughs> Uh, I had a question that Go I put ahead. in the chat um, for the per she her pronouns. Um, I said, um, how specific can clues be in relation to specialist themed knowledge? So I said, like, for example, not my actual idea, but say a mystery is themed around like the doctor's office. Could you add information in the introduction of what a typical maven would know about these sorts of things and then make that into a clue? Or is that too specific for certain keepers? Hmm, I don't know. Um, you don't have any thoughts on that? I mean, I think if you keep stuff to kind of a a smart person watching TV would know this or be able to figure it out, you're probably fine. That if it gets favorite. into, yeah, no kidding, specialized, like, you know, like, like, like terms you would have had to go to school to know, like specifically in that specialty to know, I'd probably try to steer clear of that. I will like, say it's though, okay. Yeah. I will say though, I have no problem making people Google things before they start playing. Like like most people any, anybody under the age of like 35 has to like google like almost everything on the character sheet <laughs> to like figure out what it means right um i think that's okay <laughs> i don't know if that answers your question philippa or not but like uh, i think that's uh yeah that was my thought then <laughs> yeah i think it does i think i also solved my own question in my own head because i was like wait i could just phrase the clue in a way of like yeah uh, okay. this strange thing that someone would realize is wrong <laughs> And well, and going back to also what uh, kind of what Jonah was asking about too, uh, about like how rich and complex sh should you be with like introducing new ideas and places and stuff, you can handle a lot in the presentation of the mystery, right? Like that is really your space to like give the keeper all the information they need to run this thing, right? So yeah, uh, Ben. Yeah, I was just gonna mention that you know a clue could also theoretically, you know be indecipherable uh, as sort of in its presentation and maybe it forces the mavens to go and talk to a suspect who is a specialist, um, you know, if it's appropriate to the setting. A great clue is a random sequence of numbers. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I think let's players figure it out. <laughs> Amanda? I think too, you know, this is TV. 
on, on TV, you got two people hacking at the same time. It's, it's, it doesn't have to make a whole bunch of sense. I'm thinking very specifically about uh, Star Trek Voyager, which is the best Star Trek, and I know Justin will agree. Uh, and if nobody, no comments, please. Um, but Star Trek Voyager, when you, when you watch that show, all of the jargon and stuff they use, none of it makes any sense. But it doesn't need to, because that's not really the point. And I think that if you have jargon and whatnot, and it's kind of nonsensical in the clues, it's fine. It's, it's TV. People will take it as they will. Uh, questions or comments? Taking a look at, look at the chat while we're and you could always add sort of clarifying uh, information to the clue, such as like, here's this uh, complicated Latin term for this plant. It's very poisonous. And like, that's all you really need. Like, and for the most part with like me being confused by stuff in the game, I refuse to Google stuff. I'm, I'm just like, I won't know what this means and I will make it up at the table. <laughs> That is also allowable. <laughs> I think you should all know who Dorothy Spornak is, but I won't. I won't come to your house and make you Google it. So, um, fantastic. Okay. Any other questions? I didn't see anything else in the chat, but maybe put it in the chat again in case I missed it. If you did have a question you want to get to, uh, go ahead, chaotic. In terms of uh, well, void clues is like an like. Like how, like, I want to sort of expand like the midwives a bit. And I like, I know it's, there's this whole thing with Kickstarter and that, that's fine. Like I'm, but I'm still going to do my, my idea and because it's, does handle a lot with a uh, Greek uh, uh, mythos and whatnot. Oh, uh, and if you incorporate like various other myths into it, and trying to build up the world through that, like, how, like, is there a way to actually incorporate the dark conspiracy into a mystery directly? Outside of the void clues, you mean? Or yeah, just like, 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 sort of like. Oh yeah, the, I mean, look like, at exit, exit stage death, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, exit stage death introduces a whole a whole ass other cult. <laughs> Right? Like it's like here's a whole other cult. <laughs> like it's an it's an opposition to the midwives, right? And they have their own like they're a Hades cult, right? Like mm -hmm. like the midwives are a Persephone cult. And they're like the the estranged husband cult, right? Um, they call it the King in Shadows, but it's pretty clearly supposed to be Hades, right? Um, and so that is a way you can do it, right? I think mm -hmm. you should. I think you should probably be careful about like saying too much about. The conspiracy itself i mean maybe mm -hmm. if you want to like play with ideas of greek myth that's very smart to do they can do that uh if you want to um you know just have a lot of like interesting descriptive details that don't otherwise implicate the campaign story too much i think that's probably okay as mm -hmm. well um but you, you as a general matter you might want to be a little careful uh, how much you def define midwives things just because we don't know how things are going to go once yeah. the campaign starts right in the kickstarter in the kickstarter books we're going to expand on the lore of the midwives quite a bit but it's all going to be just like suggestions and guidelines we don't believe in canonical settings in the gauntlet like it's all just like <laughs> cool ideas that may be true <laughs> yeah. right so yeah um and taking a look here, any other questions or anything else before we take a look? Go ahead, Amanda. This is just me, um, and maybe this is a little bit more on the how to be a good keeper side. But in the between, uh, there is the the section in a, in a threat that has the moments, and those are so wonderful for framing up threats. Is there I'm, I'm a way briefly. to put that into? I'm going to interrupt you briefly. We're adding that to the mysteries for the Kickstarter as well. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, I was hoping you were going to say yeah. that. Wonderful. Yeah, moments we're, are great. Yeah, the, all the mysteries are getting reworked in this way. Uh, 
they're going to yeah. have location details and moments because basically we learned a lot from the between so we're going to take a lot of the learning from the between and put it right away right yeah. that's what this is letting us do sorry but your question sorry <laughs> oh i was just asking uh, how would you go about incorporating moments into brindlewood bay and your answer is we're doing that <laughs> we're doing that uh we don't care if you do it if you got the word count go for it i don't care uh the judges won't care um it, it's not you don't have to, uh, but if you want to see how they're done, you can look at a between mystery and it, it basically just, I consider moments to be sort of mechanical free, like free agents. They have no bearing on the rules. They're just like there to make the keeper look cool. <laughs> um, and so if you don't want to list though, I mean, you know, uh, the way you describe, like the way, well, the way you describe characters, you know, is a good way of doing it. Um, you can, put those details into the presentation of the mystery is another good place to put those little like descriptive bits you know you can even put your moments in the presentation you can be like as part of the presentation you can be like here's some cool moments to share during the during the session and then you just bullet point them out right you can totally do that like the pre the presentation of the mystery is your playground to to make them to make the mystery you want to make right like and as long as you're preparing the keeper sufficiently to how to do it how to run it yeah Any other questions or comments? Uh, oh, I see hands up, good. Uh, Martin, I, I just realized there's a little emoji for the hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, it says in the, the doc that um, we shouldn't come to the clue writing process with our own ideas or solutions for the mystery. Um, but could we possibly, um, could we like um, maybe have an idea or two and dedicate like four clues for each. Um, yeah, I, it's I, I see where you're, I see where we're going with that. Um, the general advice would be: don't approach the clues with, like, do your best to like expunge your own theories from your mind, right? Like as you're writing the clues, because if you don't, it's going to influence your thinking. That said, I do think it is helpful to have a couple clues in there that point in certain directions, in which case maybe come up with a few of your own theories, but don't get too married to any of them. Don't get too committed to any of them because it is going to make writing the clues uh, harder. It's going to make the clue list less useful at the table. Um, and uh, there's no good answer there. Sadly, it's just, um, <laughs> just, it's just I, 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 I think you should try not to have too much preconceived ideas about what's going on. Uh, but yeah, uh, Sasha. I, I will. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, David, no. I, I was just going to say I kind of have a slightly dissenting opinion there in the sense I I find it helps me to have just not like a a definitive one answer for this mystery, but to have a couple of answers of like linking through why certain suspects may have done it and then right. putting in clues yeah. that that put them there. So so that's something that I find helps me as when I'm writing them. But I think if you're one of the things I think that's quite again maybe i'm wrong maybe it's it's just the way i look at it but what i think is quite important is when you have written out your clues if if you can see stuff like clustered together on the page that's kind of related to the same thing try and break them up a bit so that they're more randomly distributed kind of thing um but the thing is i think that one even if you as a writer go into it with an idea in your head of who you think the strongest suspects are and what you think their motive might have been by the time that has by the time the keeper has picked that up and read it and presented the clues to the players at the table, and then the players have taken those clues and done what with them, there are so many degrees of separation by that point. It's they're not going to get what you've, or, or they might do, but you know, yeah, it's. I, I think it's um, it's something that helps me to have some of those ideas in there. But like I said, yeah, don't don't try and force that to be the outcome. Just use it as a guide for your the way that you write it, sort of thing. Yeah, and that's why I didn't say it in my original comments, even though it's in the document, because I, I think that's I think that's probably the right. It's really just going to depend on your personal preferences to some degree. But, uh, Sasha, so we talked a bit about how the presenting the mystery interception does a lot of heavy lifting in terms of introducing the scenario, setting up stakes, and uh, Maven investment. But I guess what's a good rule of thumb for length before it just gets you know a little too dominant. Uh, when you're done, if you're over the word count, <laughs> go back and cut some things. <laughs> That's basically it, right? Um, there, there are different lengths, right? Like exit stage death, 
I really recommend looking at that one because that's a long one, right? It has a really long presentation of the mystery um, uh, because there's so much going on in that one. Whereas like, you know, Dad Overboard or All Hollow Scream, it's a really simple, straightforward thing. And I don't think it has to be like super ornate and with all kinds of like stuff going on, like exit stage death has for it to, to stand out. It can be something simple like, you know, the characters are at a cosplay convention, describe their costume, right? It can be something simple like that, right? That, that as long as it's just, it, you know, just a little way of like making the, the mystery just that much more interesting or special. Interactive elements are cool. Um, something that we added to the Great Brindlewood Bay Bake Off after some uh, folks were playing the original version is keepers were having their players pull up the picture of their maven's cake on their phone. And then that picture from the internet was what their maven baked. And I love that so much that I've made that part of the official mystery, right? You can do things like that, like little interactive elements as well. Uh, it doesn't have to be something super elaborate. Uh, to answer your question, just make sure you're coming in under word count. So, <laughs> or at word count. In Jim's case, Jim always submits precisely the number <laughs> of words that is allowed. <laughs> that actually well, kind of outs me. They're supposed to be anonymous. I should probably stop doing that. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I, I I know after the fact, but well, so for the last contest, I knew, I knew because I was not a judge, but I was like, yeah, Jim will, Jim will get it right on the on the on the nose. <laughs> Any other, uh, we're just about done with this hour, but any other just quick questions at the end here or thoughts? Uh, I know for uh, my uh, mystery uh, that my sort of uh, interactivity is that the Mavens are setting up a booth for uh, uh, a festival. And I was like, hey, what are you bringing to the booth? Are there any items that you snuck in that the rest of the mavens don't know about? And uh, that sort of thing of just like, and I just like have an aim to just like see like any sort of like fun little shenanigans about like hiding things in like the booth or just sort of subliminal things. So, yeah. Fantastic, thank you. A uh, quick question about word count. Uh, it looks like someone looked it up. Thank you, Martin. Uh, yes, it's 2,500 for a murder mystery and 3,000 for a sweeps week. That's a lot. I think the longest ones we published are like 2,300. So you have a lot of word count there vis-a-vis -vis the official mysteries anyway. So. Um, okay, let's go ahead and take a five minute break. We'll come back and do hour three. Hour three is going to be about sweeps week mystery distinctions and then uh, just general questions. So if there's just something we didn't cover or something you thought of after the fact, you can ask us then. And so we'll come back in five. Okay, the third hour is going to be about sweep sweep mystery distinctions. And then at the end, we'll have just general questions as well. So sweep sweep mystery, just to recap or to review, this is a mystery that is not necessarily a murder. It can be any kind of mystery. It has a more supernatural focus usually, and it does not take place in Brindlewood Bay. And in fact, what we've seen in like the official ones, but also things that we've seen other people writing, it's a really great opportunity to take the action somewhere completely different, right? Like, um, let's let's go to England and have the Midsummer Murders, Rosemary and Time style mystery, right? Or let's go, um, you know, to the West Coast, you know, instead of the East Coast or whatever, right? Uh, so it's an opportunity to really explore different, um, different ideas for Brindlewood Bay, right? They are, no matter what, it's all united by the fact that the characters are still the same characters. Uh, they should have a reason for being in that place, <laughs> right? Like when you're presenting the mystery, there should be a reason why all the mavens are in Mexico or whatever, right? Um, and as long as you sort of establish pretty well like what is going on and why they're there, you're, you're in good shape. But the key things, not necessarily a murder, a somewhat more supernatural, sometimes a lot more supernatural focus and not in Brindlewood Bay. Now, distinctions are, it has a section called Solving the Mystery, it has a new crown <laughs> and it has rewards. Solving the Mystery essentially you are, since it's not a murder mystery, 
you do have to tell the play group and the keeper especially, but the whole play group, what it means to theorize about this mystery, right? So what are we actually trying to accomplish? When we roll theorize, what, is, what are the stakes? What are we trying to figure out? Also, when you're writing a sweeps week mystery, I would have that be the first thing you write because everything has to support that, right? <laughs> like your clues have to, even if it's very loose, your clues fundamentally have to support the exploration of that mystery, right? And so be thinking about like, what does it mean to solve the mystery? I'm gonna use some between examples here because the between is about not, it's about all kinds of mysteries and, and in particular supernatural ones. Some of those mysteries are just basic things like where is the killer or where is the monster? That's the, the questions that you answer. Um, some of them are about motive. Why did this person do this? Why does this person do this? The more interesting in some ways or not interesting, but like more um, strange kinds of mysteries can be what is the process by which we accomplish something, right? So maybe the mavens have to help a rival cult, you know, do some ritual or something, I don't know. Or maybe the mavens have to uh, figure out some kind of, um, uh, something has happened of a supernatural nature and they have, have to figure out how to undo it, right? So the, the, the theorizing can be about a process. And so what when they answer the, when they do the theorize, when they're, the question they're answering, the mystery they're trying to answer is like the steps of a process. Those are different types of mysteries, right? It's really pretty limitless, if I'm being honest. There's no, there are no real boundaries here. As long as you explain in this section what the mystery is, what does it mean to solve it, right? Um, it can also just be a murder mystery too, but with just a supernatural bent that is also allowed, uh, like the stretch goal we're on right now is a sweep sweep mystery, but it's a murder. Uh, it's called, you can lead a horse to murder. I think I think, it's, I think the implication is the horse did it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in any case, that's, uh, that's what solving the mystery is. The new crowd. So the thing about sweep sweep mysteries is they are going to be played outside of the midwives conspiracy. So whether that's a side story or if it's the reason why we created them in the first place, people were finishing the campaign and wanted to keep playing the characters, right? So, so we created these little one-off mysteries so they could keep playing their characters, right? Um, no matter what, the, the, it, it's, it exists outside of the midwives conspiracy. Because it exists outside of the midwives conspiracy and because it might happen after the mavens have already marked a lot of crowns, there is the necessity to have a way for the mavens to survive the mystery, right? Because if they're if they've already done a full campaign, they might have marked, you know, three quarters of all their crowns already, and the crowns are essentially like a long term hit point bar, right? And once those are out, you're 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 at the mercy of the dice at that point. And so, um, having you have the crown in the specific mystery to basically just to help ensure that the mavens can play it. And it, so even if the characters are already pretty well used up as far as that goes, it gives, it lets them extend their life a little bit, extend their playability a little bit. The crowns also help explore an idea connected to the, uh, to the mystery. And here's when we where we really get into like lore building and world building, right? Because the crown, uh, the crown of the queen and the crown of the void have big lore implications. They are about Persephone. They are about the idea of womanhood, right? The crown in your sweep sweep mystery can also explore a big idea, right? And and so that is uh, it's an opportunity to really really show what your mystery is about, right? And so if we look at some examples, the hex files. Um, the crown in the hex files, I believe it has one. Let me see if I can find it. Maybe it doesn't, I don't know. Oh no, this one doesn't have one. Okay, well, there you go. I guess I don't have to have one then. Oh no, there it is. It's behind my mic, sorry. <laughs> uh, crown of the woods. It's about exploring the woods around the, uh, around the, um, the location, but in particular, and I have to scooch my head a little bit. Oh. It's ideas of things being obscured, 
about natural disasters, about reacting more on instinct rather than because you can't see things or know things. It's, 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 it's exploring different ideas and it's called The Crown of the Woods. I believe that there's one in the mystery, uh, Let the Night One In, that's called like The Crown of the Frozen North or something like that. It's all about like coldness and Canada <laughs> and like frozenness, right? Um, it's all that kind of stuff, right? Um, it's an idea, it's a chance to like really like build some lore and to build some big ideas and to explore some themes. Structurally, they should have three marks, meaning there's three different prompts there. Um, but yeah, that's basically what the crowns are. They, 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 that is the purpose they serve. And that's kind of how you structure them. Rewards are pretty simple and it's very open-ended. Um, the idea behind rewards is because these mysteries are one-offs and might not, uh, they might be like side stories that are not directly connected to the conspiracy. There has to be a reason for the mavens to want to do it, right? Like, like they, they, they want to finish it. And this is part of the incentive to finish this mystery so that they can get the rewards at the end. Uh, that's kind of the basic idea. It also kind of steals from the between a little bit. The between has rewards as well. It's a much bigger part of that game, but it's just another, you know, it's just a way of like uh, creating almost like a keepsake of the mystery. Like we did this little side mystery and in exchange, I got this cool thing that now we will remember forever, right? So we don't forget it. That's kind of the idea. They are frequently things that can be added to a cozy little place. They can be recurring side characters from that mystery. Um, they can be brand new moves if you're, if you're daring and you want to write a brand new move, by all means do that. Um, I say look at the between and lift some stuff from there because the idea is much more explored in that game than it is in Sweep Sweep Mysteries. But there should be like two or three, probably not more than that. Um, and yeah, just ways of kind of memorializing and creating a reward structure for these side mysteries, basically. Right? Those are the three major distinctions of Sweep Sweep Mysteries. We've talked about some of the other things in the previous topics or the previous hours. Um, I, I will note something Sam asked about, it's worth emphasizing here again. The, the clues in a sweep sweep mystery, in my opinion, are easier to write because they are so, they're just like, you just have to, they just have to be cool and weird. <laughs> uh, they don't have to have a lot of like uh, grounded mundanity, which is actually harder to write in my opinion. Um, so don't, so you should really feel free to kind of just like write whatever weird thing you wanna write because frankly, the, the players will take care of the rest. Like you don't have to worry about that, um, but yeah. Okay, so those are my notes on Sweep Sweep Mystery Distinctions. And at this point, I'll turn it over to questions about these things, but also just general questions about writing the mystery if anybody has something they want to talk about that we have not covered. Um, so I will take a look, see if I see any hand. I love the hand emojis, but I don't see any right now. So if anybody has a hand up or wants to ask a question. I'm not seeing it. Oh, I see a hand emoji. Ben, go ahead. Yeah, um, I have a, a genre question. Of course, uh, you know, most of the supernatural things within in Brindlewood Bay fall in the sort of weird fiction um, category, which is a pretty broad category. Um, I'm thinking about something like slightly uh, you know, Bradbury inspired, um, and I'm wondering how how sciency is too sciency, perhaps, for something like uh, Brindlewood Bay. I'll let others chime in. Jim. I mean, like, there is there is no such thing. You can, like, the whole point of the Swiss mystery is that it can be as weird as you want, that it can be you know, an alternate reality where the, you know, the, the, like, like, we're just going to, for a second, we're going to take a look and see, you know, what happened if the space program never ended and, and this is where we're dropping the mavens into, but you absolutely can always do a thing where it's like, they go to a science fiction, you know, themed theme park, right. And they're stuck on the set of a science fiction TV show. And so, you know, or they're like on a, you know, on one of these, like, like themed cruises because I, I actually when jason ran a game i played a maven who was like a star trek fan from like 1967 and she was like other was like super buttoned down and really waspy but like that was the one thing where she got her freak on right and so you can totally 
do that however you want. And and like, and there's like tricks and ways to kind of get around that to make it like it's all science fiction, but not really, or you know, whatever. Like they're all playing a video game together, and the entire mystery is their characters in the video game or something like that. Yeah, you know, there's like I would say like like the weirder the better for the sweeps me week stuff. I agree. And I would also say that like the 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 cosmic horror slash Lovecraftian slash eldritch horror kind of approach, that's really for the core campaign, right? I think I think that's where that really should be coming out. And it's not even the whole campaign. It's just like the back half of the campaign. Um, I think you should feel free to do whatever kind of stuff you want to do in the sweepstick mysteries. That's my opinion. Right? Yeah. yeah. And from my games, like uh, just of seeing the between Brenda Wood Bay, like staying on genre isn't really a thing. Uh, especially with the between because like the between like its most recent season is literal sci-fi yeah it like changes it to a sci-fi thing right yeah like it's like it's like we're dealing with spaceships we're dealing with mar uh venusians not martians because there's only one martian who is literally just superman like they're like as long as like you have like just a hatch of like a thread to mundane uh, like m- like a mundane explanation or something like you're good like well and also i would say for brindlewood Bay specifically the very like unifying elements are going to be the mavens themselves mm-hmm. um and so as long as the setup is kind of like what jim was saying as long as the setup like seems like something the mavens would be doing <laughs> uh it's probably good also there is a sort of like kitsch quality to the mysteries, which is important. There's a certain camp humor. There's dramatic irony to a lot of it. Like that, those elements help make all of it work, right? It's it's what makes just the basic concept of <laughs> cosmic horror and murder mysteries together like work, right? And so it'll be it'll work for any other genre things. Yeah, for sure. I uh, think Sam, as well. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead, David. I, I was going to go to Sam though after that. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, um, I think as well, it's it's kind of part of the strength of the uh, the way that the mysteries work is that they are kind of by their nature, you know, they're, they're modular, they're optional. So if, if like someone, I mean, like my, myself, you know, like, like to, to, to nail my flag to the wall there, I'm, I'm not super into sci-fi. I don't find sci-fi games that interesting in general. So I like... I personally, if I were running the game, I might not pick up uh, and run a module that was like leaning more into that sci-fi side of things. But I will also think it's cool that that exists and that someone has written that and that some people will like that kind of thing. It's it's it you know not not every not every threat not every mystery uh, needs to um, uh, everyone you know not, not everyone is going to enjoy everyone. And I mean like there's again sort of like particularly actually if that said actually in fairness even in even with Brentwood Bay um and also with the between there's both times I've I've sort of run those games there've there've been specific threats that I have kind of not run because of certain lines and veils we've had on the table because it's like someone's identified something that comes up in that you know as a core theme that mystery is something that they they don't really want to see. Um and so I think there's always going to be a bit of like pick and mix with with what with what threats what modules run so i don't yeah, think variety that, is good right yeah, yeah exactly so yeah i don't think that you should let that constrain what you want to do with a with with, with your writing that's why we also recommend there being 20 clues uh which is way more than you ever need uh because so that because the variety also helps with like just the tastes of the play group or whatever particular like um uh <laughs> if you're if you're if you're like doing a you know if someone puts as a line or veil like um you know family history or trauma right like you you know well maybe you don't do data overboard or maybe you don't do you know one of these mysteries so you have other mysteries to choose from or for the clues maybe you don't include the clue where you know there's like uh you know a a, a messy divorce or something right like like, like you, you the variety is there also for just like the table culture and the table expectations as well so um Fantastic. Any other questions? Uh, and I know Sam, I thought I saw your hand up, but I don't know if you still. Yeah, um, and looking at the sweeps mysteries, it seems like the crowns that are in there tend to 
more closely relate to like the crown of the queen prompts. Um, but I was wondering what you thought of maybe um, having like a, a closer to the crown of the void structure for a sweeps week. Uh, yeah. Component. Well, so the thing about it is for the rules of the game, like this is in the rules, uh, although it's not, it's easy to miss because they're kind of like, these are rules that have been Mm. not fully formalized in the books yet like in where anybody can find them easily it's more just like you have to know a guy you know uh, but the rules are the crown of the void is not in play at all during a sweep sweep mystery it is not a thing that is in play uh that helps separate it from the midwives conspiracy and it also makes it to where the characters don't lose any of their quote-unquote life bar to this side mystery, right? And so just at the outset, I would note that that is a sort of a rules thing that you have to consider. I don't think it's super important for the contest. Um, I think like if we were gonna publish it or something, we would probably change it to make it fit the structure of the rules better. Um, so if, if I understand your question correctly though, it's like, what you're asking is like making the, making the prompts more weird as opposed to more like backstory yeah more weird okay. yeah. and maybe like you know you, with the chariot like there's um modifiers are changed so like it could be for oh the, sure yeah um so not permanent like i think yeah. i would put a note or something so mine is going to be sort of not salem but like uh, uh talking like witch trial and like sort of dancing around this idea of like yeah. persecution for things that you believe in and um things like that so but i'm i guess like i like the flashbacks but i really um i guess there's the present day in crown you know what you could but... do you know what you could do instead if, if you don't want to like get too into weeds about like doing like hard mechanical things like modifiers and stuff yeah what you could do is you could say after you're done narrating this, tell the players that this is a good justification for the occult move, right? Mm, because the mm -hmm. occult move, which we haven't talked about today, the occult move doesn't come up very often in the game. It's, it's intentional. It only comes up to like maybe once or twice a campaign, but you have to have a reason for engaging mm -hmm. the occult move. Mm -hmm. So a great reason for engaging the occult move is the mavens learn something about Tichaba or somebody in the Salem mm -hmm. witch trials, right? And so mm -hmm. that's their that's the basis for getting that move rolled. And so that's something you could do. You can like use the existing frameworks and rules and just like say, this is a good reason to do an occult move based off of inspired by this or based off this or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. You can totally yeah. do that as well. But, 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 but to answer your question, I think it's okay. I think try it. I mean, I say go for it. You know? I mean, if it seems cool. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Any other thoughts or questions? Taking a look at the chat. Yeah, Jim noted here, um, you can even make the reward like write an occult move that does that. Yeah, you could totally do that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, yeah, I think anytime you can work within the existing structure of the game, it's good. That, that goes back to what you asked earlier, Sam, about like mysteries that impl implicate the, the various marks on the crown of the void that's part of the reason why I did it that way so that it's 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 that's a structure that you get to kind of play around in but it's, but it's still like dependable and re and repeatable across mysteries you know mm -hmm. so that's that's one thing for sure um yeah Martin's point adding rules is fine but always try to use what's there that's that's exactly right like we've tried to give you plenty of toys to play with but um but but what you can do if you do decide to create a custom move or a custom rule or something that changes the rules, what you're really doing is you're highlighting its specialness, right? If what you're creating does not feel like it's a special moment, then it's probably not worth doing, right? And there might be an existing system that takes care of it. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Okay. Not seeing anything. I'm checking chat. Okay. Well, then I think we might be good to go. Um, so I will uh, remind you all that the contest runs through May 22nd, and you can submit one of each type of mystery. Uh, please do not put your name anywhere on the document. Um, I'll know what which mystery is yours just because I'm receiving them all, but I'm gonna be putting them in a folder that is anonymized for the judges. So the judges won't know who's writing the mysteries and the judges won't be watching these videos or anything like that either. They're gonna, they're not gonna have any idea who wrote which mystery. Um, 
And yeah, I think that's basically it. Also, I really hope that what everyone's taking from this experience is not like the contest, uh, but like that this is just a fun thing to do because that's mm -hmm. the idea, right? Like the reason why I set aside three hours to do this is just because I think it's like a fun, engaging thing to do and it's exciting. Um, in our experience, the quality of the entries is always really, really good. And so the the winners are usually just like the best of a very good bunch. And so don't ever, don't feel like it's a reflection of your particular skills or talents or anything. Um, it, uh, it is, um, if you follow the structure and, and, and you'll, 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 you'll do good, you'll, you'll write something good. Um, the entries are being judged on creativity, quality of writing, and playability. Playability came up a lot today, so I'd remember that stuff. Um, creativity, really, the presentation of the mystery is a great place to explore creativity and do something really cool and fun. And quality of writing, uh, we can't help you with that. <laughs> um, maybe get somebody to proofread it. Uh, and um, and I, I say spend some time on your quotes. I think I think spending a little time on your quotes and making the quote for each character really, really good is time very well spent. Um, that's, those are the kinds of mysteries I like to play. I like to run the ones where the quotes are really good because it tells me what I'm gonna be doing to, to, to actually uh, role play that. Um, yeah, if there's nothing else, I will say thank you all so much for joining the workshop. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording right now.